Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome again to Olivet Seminary and the lectures on biblical personal ethics. Things uh, that the Bible teaches, the wisdom, the guidance, God's direction for our lives to walk with God on earth in these days. And this is a great opportunity to really grow in our fellowship with God as we are more attuned to what he teaches us in his word, in the Bible. So biblical personal ethics matters. And this is the sixth lecture. We're focusing today on following biblical exemplars that are very transformative because God has given them to give light to our paths. And we'll look especially at uh, examples of compassion and koinonia, you know, sharing uh, the goodness of God that uh, each of us has to be good stewards in encouraging, especially brothers and sisters. Now, Jesus taught four core commands, and we've been focusing on understanding that uh, a list of four, and they're all rooted also in Micah 6, 8. And the command that we did uh, give some attention to, a lot of attention to in lecture five and, and again today, is the command to love your neighbor as yourself. And these five words capture what Jesus says is the whole law and the prophets. And three of the Gospel writers uh, record this, and uh, Paul and James also very strongly uh, make this a, a central guidance, a uh, huge principle for our lives together. So Jesus taught, love your neighbor as yourself. And when he was teaching this, as recorded in uh, Luke chapter 10, at the end, toward the end of Luke chapter 10, a lawyer in the audience, of, in the class, in the a group of people listening to Jesus' great teaching said, well, who is my neighbor? <laughs> to love my neighbor as myself. Now, Luke, the author of the Gospel according to Luke, comments that the Lord was, was just trying to justify himself, He's kind of looking for a loophole maybe, or looking for an opportunity to excuse himself or to justify himself. We're, we're really, but the purpose of Jesus' teaching isn't for us to justify ourselves, but to be on the right path, to do things that, that enhance God's reputation, that give a good name to God if we are godly people. So the, the Good Samaritan story, uh, it, it'd be good to review, to read again, and um, it's, a, it's an amazing story because it's life transforming. People that are not even believers in Jesus talk often about it. It has been a focal point of many uh, movements of compassion for other people. But yet you can read the entire thing in 70 seconds, just a little over one minute. And the parable is very uh, cleverly written because it, it jars our senses uh, and especially the people listening to Jesus because the Samaritan people were looked down on but Jesus made uh, a hero out of a Samaritan. Also Jesus had had a rough time. There were Samaritans that had kicked him out of their towns just in in the previous uh, sections of, of Luke. Um, so Jesus didn't have any like personal reason other than that is the representative of God as God himself on earth. Jesus loves everybody and chose to shock people. And and also the caregivers, the standard caregivers, the Levites and the priests were supposed to be the models of compassion. And yet in the story, they actually go to the other side of the road and walk by and are not uh, committed, not really engaged. And and the other shock of the story is that Jesus uses the story, this one-minute story, to turn the question around. The question isn't, who is my neighbor, to look for an excuse not to help, but in fact, who is the neighbor, 
to the one in need, to really be proactive as neighbors ourselves. So uh, it's, it's a profound story that you could tell in just a little bit more than a minute. Now, the spiritual leaders in the beginning of the story, uh, you know, see that there's a person that's uh, beat up, left for dead, robbed, uh, and, and they go to the other side of the road so as not to uh, see. And so they were choosing ignorance rather than to, say, at least pray over the person. If they didn't know the medicine, didn't know what they could do, if they were afraid because they too might be beat up, robbed, and, and, and left for dead. But instead, they just go to the other side of the road, which is a huge symbol of wanting to be ignorant. And I would say culpably ignorant. Um, that That's not an excuse to uh, just say, well, I didn't really see what was wrong. And so the spiritual leaders did not represent our compassionate God who himself comes to earth to save us, who himself uh, is the representative, is the himself the uh, perfect representative of love and compassion. So these spiritual leaders did not set a good example. Now, there are many surprises. As we said, the, the Good Samaritan was an unlikely hero in terms of people's attitudes uh, because of his ethnicity and and really unknown profession. He was not a professional caregiver. But also, in the, according to the story, the others kind of saw and then went to the other side of the road. The, the language is very powerful here in the story that the Good Samaritan saw compassionately, had compassion with his eyes. It's in one action in the, in the original Greek. It's one action had compassion with his eyes. So he was already, by seeing, he was already, his his heart, his guts, his his mind was already moving to to do something. It's what I, I call eye, heart, uh, hand coordination, everything working like immediately, not something to think about. And he obviously already had the skill, the, the knowledge of what to do in a situation like this. I think a lot of times people don't get involved, don't help because they don't know what to do, but then they don't learn. They don't go to a first aid class or a emergency technician class to, to get the knowledge. It's almost like the people want to remain numb rather than be prepared to do what is uh, compassionate, what really makes a difference for a person's life, recovery, hope. Uh, and so he had the skill. Just personally, I, years ago, I just thought, hey, I don't want that excuse of not knowing what to do. And I, I took a, a whole week of uh, classes in emergency medical technician work and got a certificate. Um, I probably should take the class again to renew the knowledge and catch up with the latest. But nevertheless, having that preparation helps us to be more loving. And when he got the victim to the, to the uh, safety of the inn, he even paid the innkeeper to take good care of the man uh, uh, and that he would repay him if there was more expense. So it was just amazing, generous, compassionate attitude that we can all learn from. And uh, it, in some ways, it's also a parable of Jesus pouring out his own love and taking care of us, putting us in a safe place. Uh, so it's a parable of salvation and at the same time, a parable for compassion ministries. Now notice the, uh, the key is the Samaritan was ready. Uh, it wasn't just uh, spur of the moment, he he was already seeing as, so to speak, with God's eyes. He had compassion with his eyes. He already knew what to do as a first responder. He uh, uh, already knew how to use his clothing and his wine as medical resources to uh, benefit the man. 
and uh, he really had a, a divine humanitarian approach to his own budget to to use money to really bless people um, and, and notice he's not giving the, the man the money uh, I think too often people think that by giving money to beggars we're, we're necessarily helping them far better to connect them with people that can help them or bring them food um, uh, because the the real issue is helping people um, and and giving the money sometimes complicates the situation but giving real help is uh, far better and that's why the church can work together it's not just a burden for each individual but to uh, be together in caring ministries um, so he was uh, this Good Samaritan was already devoted to be the good neighbor. Well, the Good Samaritan story is awesome, but the Bible has literally hundreds of love stories. It's loaded with uh, great stories of people's love and commitment and devotion to one another. And, and one that, um, one of the many that stand out is the story of uh, Jonathan and David. Uh, and, and in this, uh, these two men met after David slaughtered Goliath and, and, and David was welcomed into the, the uh, palace of uh, King Saul. And Jonathan was uh, one of the sons of King Saul. And, uh, you know, David was soon after uh, married to Michael, a daughter of King Saul. But, the, but it went deeper with Jonathan and David. There was a they even understood that it was a three-way relationship. God had brought them together. And so they made covenants together. There are four times they made or renewed a covenant, which, is, which means it's not just a contract. It's connecting with God in the presence of God, making a, a commitment to one another and looking out for each other. Even in very risky times, they were there for each other uh, for 25 years an amazing profound brotherly love uh, a, a deep caring friendship um, between two men and I, I think uh, we ought to be looking for ways that we can um, have deep relationships with God and um, other men or other women this is not anything like marriage, but it is at the same time a uh, goal for God to bring us together, to really look out for one another with a deep love, family type love, where we are actually uh, having each other's interest. Paul says that repeatedly in his letters as well. And of course, there was a great uh, example of profound devotion, love, friendship uh, between Naomi and Ruth. And uh, definitely a, a great story to read in the book of Ruth. But, but notice the key element here is, is God's participation. They made covenants in God's presence uh, to look out for one another, to bless and encourage and benefit one another. And, and, and so God was the one that also uh, guided uh, in the story of uh, Ruth as well. Uh, so it's a three-way, amazing three-way relationship. L love that draws people together is God too. So that it's not just two people that can have a friendship, but, but God's the catalyst. God is the protector. God is the source of the wisdom and guidance and light. And when we think of love, uh, we dare not neglect uh, the most precious uh, uh, kind of love between people, uh, one man, one woman, one God. And, and the great story of that is found in the Song of Songs, which is uh, a, a profound, deep um, book in the scriptures that some people take as an allegory of our love for God, the, the soul and, and Christ, soul and the Lord God uh, in the in the Hebrew scriptures too and and that is this we can learn a lot about uh, passion and intimacy 
that applies to our relationship with God is true. But even then, it shines light. That interpretation signs, still shines light back on what it is to be man and woman together in a deep, uh, unique uh, uh, commitment of engagement and marriage uh, with God as the uh, third, and actually the first, the first uh, participant in that relationship. Amazing to really celebrate God's presence in uh, marriage. So Song of Songs mentions God just once, but it's so profound. Repeatedly throughout the Song of Songs, there's this theme, don't try to arouse your beloved until the love comes naturally. You know, don't try to force anything. Don't try to make up a feeling, a sexy feeling or a, um, you know, an erotic feeling through uh, uh, bad jokes or uh, pornography or anything like that. No, no, let love be natural. That is in the sense of God's own guidance in your life. And, and so the, that love, that passion of love, the Song of Songs calls the very fire of God. So that the theme, don't try to, you know, arouse love, let it, let it be real, let it be real, is said three times. And the very last chapter, in chapter 8, verse 6, is this amazing statement. Love is stronger than death. And the passionate drive of love is more all-consuming. Its flames are flashes of fire, a pure fire of the Lord. So respect that fire. Don't play with that fire. Let, uh, let the passion of God guide to build relationship. And families or, or marriages that are, are kind of flat and not, not really passionate anymore, could uh, learn again from Song of Songs the point of the passion that God uh, wants to inflame in our lives to the ones that we are committed to in marriage and to, to be sure that it's a three-way relationship. God as the, the one that brings us together and a passion that we share with God and with uh, wife and husband. So the Song of Songs is a, a tremendous resource to understand that very special kind of love when we are thinking and doing biblical personal ethics. Now, in, in lecture number five, we examine love stories based on a family crisis, as in the prodigal son story, and love story in the sense of even a businessman having compassion for the people that are standing in the unemployment line and have been standing all day. He hires them even at the end of the day for working one hour. But on that occasion, anyway, he chooses to give them all a day's wage. Uh, and and there was that, that expectation. And he even promised the people that work 12 hours, I'm going to give you a day's wage. I'm going to treat you well. And and toward the end, he simply, I mean, he hired people that then worked only three hours or one hour. He said, I'll, I'll uh, be good to you. Come, come, work in my vineyard. And, um, and surely enough, he, he fulfilled all his commitments and more to the ones, even more than what he committed, he fulfilled to the ones that had been in the unemployment line so long and were now uh, just working for an hour or so. So, uh, an amazing story. Uh, we, we can kind of relate maybe to people that, some of us relate to people that worked all day and didn't get any more. But yet compassion is that, that love is, is not just looking for what's required, not just looking for, for what's um, the necessary fair treatment but looking at the other person's needs, looking at the other person's, you know, what's necessary for that person to help take care of his or her family and do the other things. And so compassion really matters. 
and and you know even in law do care you know a, a, a level of care for people that are working for you and under contract the, there are standards of caring that go beyond contract uh, so some of this attitude we even build in to law at least in america and, and perhaps in other places too so these those two parables are, are also great for remembering the power of love the prodigal son story is a story about god's love you know god is is the amazing father in the story uh that's true but god the father is still a model parent and parents can learn better about unconditional love for their own children and maybe for other people as well. And same with a businessman that hires uh, uh, people even to work a short time and pays them what they need for their expenses. You know, this in this great story in beginning of Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, the, the story of the vineyard owner and the, the field workers that uh, uh, do the work and he pays them all. That uh, That's also a story of love and compassion. And shocking, because we think of uh, business people sometimes as only kind of uh, stingy, but not true. And surely uh, there are opportunities if, that we all have to show compassion. Now, Jesus' principle of the love your neighbor as yourself is entirely relevant to all our relationships in church. Church should be thought of as a loving community for, for lots of reasons. That's why Jesus said twice in uh, John 13 and John 15, love one another as I have loved you. Now, I love that word as. So we already have a, a standard. The gold standard is Jesus and his love for us. And we could think of it to ourselves. Oh, I've done enough. I'm, yeah, I don't need to do it anymore. I don't need to help somebody. But yet, if we remember, the command of Jesus is to love one another as he loves us. And there are really uh, no need for bonds then. No need for boundaries other than obviously what's sensible and what uh, uh, what is uh, being a good steward in our love as well. But uh, the high standard of doing it as Jesus uh, loved us is crucial. It reminds us of the one who will help us too, Jesus. And uh, it's, it's also an evangelistic tool in that same context in John 13, Jesus says, this is how people will know you are my followers, that you are my students, if you love one another. So uh, that really is is so big a standard, a expectation that God has for what church should be about. And really from the beginning, that kind of compassion was at the center of the church there. Four pillars of the church mentioned in Acts 2.42, you know, that they they taught uh, the gospel, you know, the apostles' teaching. Uh, you know, they had fellowship, which meant that they looked out for one another. They shared each other's goods. Uh, that they um, ate uh, communion together and they prayed together. These are the, the four pillars of Acts 2.42. And the one that connects especially with love is the koinonia in the Greek word, translated sometimes fellowship or whatever. But it means sharing, where, where uh, my resources are available to you. Your resources are available to me in our, in our needs and our opportunities. So at the very center of the gospel is God's amazing love and grace. That's why when we think of love as part of a personal ethic, it is so essence, essential, so essential to live out the gospel. And the gospel of Christ is a way of, of transforming our lives, 
so that we are more like Christ and we are Christians, which means little Christ. So that in the, in Acts, people are begun had begun to be called Christians, meaning little Christ, that we really truly represent the person and priorities of Jesus Christ. And to do that, love is essential. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another. Um, have that brotherly love or sisterly love um, with people that are uh, not family, but, but are part of God's family, uh, fellow children of God. So no wonder, love your neighbor as yourself is, the, is one of those commands that Jesus said is the whole law and the prophets. He positioned it as a huge, very important standard and said so many things about our loving one another that, that we really need to be in tune with the will of Jesus and by God's grace to now live out that kind of uh, radical love for the glory of God and by his grace. Amen.